know about you, but as we sang that last song, and as we heard the nations, I mean, it's my third time to hear it this morning, and I just sat there just moved by this vision of one day, one day around the throne, every tribe, every tongue, every people, every nation, what a day that will be, amen? It is an honor to be here today with you in Jonesboro, Arkansas for many reasons, but one of them is because of how much I love your pastor and his wife. They are precious. I know you know this, but God gave you a gift when he gave you this couple to lead this fellowship. Amen? Amen. You are a blessed people. I've known Archie all the way back to when he didn't dress near as cool as he does now. His first day at seminary, he had to go in the coat closet and get some real clothes because he showed up at seminary dressed like a farmer, and they expected a coat and tie. But man, I love this man. I love his family. I thank God for the way he's led this fellowship, and I thank God for you. And I I want to bring you greetings today from thousands of church planters across North America that are joining in the activity of God of starting new churches because of your generosity through Sin Network. Our churches last year, we started 735 new churches across North America. So thank you for your investment. That happens every week as you give here. You are not giving to a church. You're giving through a church as an investment in the kingdom of God being expanded. So thank you for your generosity. And then finally, I want to bring you greetings from your brothers and sisters in Christ in Las Vegas, Nevada. Maybe you didn't know you had brothers and sisters in Christ in Las Vegas, but you do. It's a city that God called me to 22 years ago. When I moved there 22 years ago with my family, it was a city of 1.3 million people. Now it's a city of almost 2.8 million people. Over a million and a half people have moved there in the 20 years that I've been there. And we have another million tourists a week that visit there. So almost 4 million people sleep there every night in Las Vegas. But it's a place where God is alive and at work. I know that you know Las Vegas as Sin City, right? All over the world. I was training pastors, Archie, one time on the backside of Zambia on the border of Lake Tanganyika that shores up against Tanzania. It was a hut. We were training pastors. A witch doctor came against us. We led him to Christ. We trained him to plant a church. And I'm, I'm, I get up and introduce myself. I'm Vance Pimmer from Las Vegas, Nevada. And some guy in the back of the hut goes, oh, Sin City, like all over the world. Everybody knows Vegas is Sin City, but here's what I'm telling you. Where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. The darker the darkness, the brighter the light of the gospel, and we've seen God do unbelievable things. Started for me in September 1999. I I had just graduated seminary. I was sitting in my living room in Memphis, Tennessee, reading the gospels one morning. Saw something in Jesus that wasn't in me in Luke 4, a passion for the kingdom of God to be expanded to other cities. I went and got my wife. We said, Lord, yes. We don't know where. We don't know when. But the answer is yes. We really thought we were going overseas. Two weeks later, First Baptist Church, Woodstock, Georgia, contacts me and says, Vance, our church in Woodstock, Georgia, feels led of the Lord to start a church in Las Vegas, Nevada. God's put it on our heart. You're to be the pastor of that church. Uh, Two weeks earlier, we said yes. Two weeks later, God had the audacity to fill in the blank with Las Vegas. You say, why do you say that? Because I'm born and raised in Alabama. And if you're from Alabama, you don't go to Las Vegas. And if you do, you don't tell anybody, right? I mean, where I'm from, they don't think Las Vegas is hell, but they think you can smell it from there. Like, it's close. We're... But for the last 22 years of my life, we've been there with my family. We've been, we started in our living room with 18 people in the early parts of 2001. And now, 22 years later, we've seen almost 5,000 people baptized into that fellowship, new believers. It's a beautiful scene on Sundays, man. We look like heaven. It's 54 languages represented in our fellowship. It's the most multi-ethnic, multicultural church I've ever personally been a part of. Uh, what you did this morning, we do about once a month. We sing in multiple languages because so many languages are represented in our church. It's a beautiful thing to see. Out of the, the church that's been planted there, we've now had the privilege of starting 80 churches in the western United States out of that church, sending out about 400 people to go plant those churches. 
Uh, we, we do a church planter training. We've had 800 church planters go through our training at our church there in Las Vegas. And now I, I serve as the president of Send Network, the largest church planting, nor, nor, uh, church planting network in North America. Now, I'm not telling you that so you know my pedigree. I'm telling you that because I want you to feel the weight of the next statement that I'm about to make. So you just heard me tell you my life story. The large part of my adult life has been given to starting new churches. But listen to this statement. The church is not the goal. This is not the finish line. The local New Testament church is not the goal. Let me prove it to you. Every local church dies. Can I give you a word of discouragement today? One day, this beautiful place where you're sitting, this wonderful fellowship, I don't know how long it'll be, 10 years, 20 years, 100 years, I don't know. But at some point, Central Baptist Church of Jonesboro, Arkansas is going to die. You know how I know that? Because all churches do. They all have a life cycle. They're born, they live, they die. If you don't believe me, go find any church Paul wrote a letter to in the New Testament. Every church got a book deal in the New Testament is dead and gone. Ephesus, Corinth, Philippi, Thessalonica, those churches were once thriving epicenters of gospel activity in the first century. Today, they are a pile of rocks. But here's what I want you to hear me say. Although local churches come and local churches go, the kingdom of God is alive and well. You see, the goal is not the local New Testament church. The goal is the kingdom of God expanded in cities and nations all over the world. And Jesus gave us the church as the tool to be used for the expansion of the kingdom in cities and nations around the world. I'm not saying the the local church is not important. It is important. It's the only tool Jesus gave us for the expansion of the kingdom in cities and nations around the world. But the goal is the kingdom of God. Let me show it to you in the book of Revelation chapter 5. The verse of scripture that they put on the screen during that song a moment ago. Look what it says, Revelation 5, verse 9. It says, They sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every, say it out loud with me, every tribe and language. Come on, say it with me. Every tribe and language and people and nation. How many of you have heard that verse before? You know what that verse is, right? It's a verse where the Holy Spirit of God allowed, the God allowed John the Apostle to see into eternity future a scene that in eternity future is already taking place. King Jesus sitting on the throne, ruling and reigning over the kingdom of God for all eternity made up of every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. You know the problem with verse 9? We never read verse 10. Look at verse 10. It says, and you have made them a what? Say it out loud. You know where this whole thing called Christianity is moving? One day somewhere out there, the last soul is going to be born again through the shed blood of Jesus Christ into the kingdom of God. And here's what's going to happen. One day, the Lord himself, King Jesus, is going to descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ are going to be raised first. And we who are alive and remain are going to be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And then for all eternity, here's what it is. It's not Central Baptist in Jonesboro and First Methodist and Hope Church. In eternity, it's King Jesus sitting on the throne. It's the kingdom of God ruling and reigning made up of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. I don't think you're as excited about that as I wish you were. But I'm telling you, that's where this whole thing's moving. It's not just going to be church like this forever. You see, the local New Testament church is the gathering place to introduce people to King Jesus, the discipleship center to train them in kingdom living, And then the launching pad to send them out for the expansion of the kingdom to the ends of the earth. And here's what we've done in the church in America. We've made this the goal. This is not the goal. This is the tool. Here's what we've done. We've taken the church and we've made the mission of God a little department in the church we call missions. And that's reserved for the weirdos. 
who go get the special ops training down the dark hallway at the church and go on those mission trips. No, there's not missions. We need to crucify the S. There's only the mission. There's just one. From Genesis to Revelation, there's one mission. What is it? God redeeming to himself a people from every tribe, tongue, people, nation that will be his kingdom for all eternity. That's the mission. And the whole reason this church exists is the accomplishment of the mission of God. Leads to a question that I want to ask and answer this morning. How do we connect this to the big picture of what God's doing in the world? If the kingdom is the goal, how do we get it in proper bounds? Well, take your Bible, turn to Philippians chapter 4. I want to read you a text of scripture about a church here in Philippi that lived this out in the first century and let them be an example for us of how we can connect our local church to the big picture of God's kingdom activity. Philippians 4 verse 15, here's what it says. And you Philippians yourselves... Know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent help, me help more for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift itself, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus... The gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. Then verse 19, the verse all of us know, and my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. We like that verse, amen? If you like that verse, say amen. Amen. Here's the problem with that verse. It's not a blank check. It's a conditional promise to those living out verses 15 through 18. We're going to unpack that. Verse 20, now to our God and Father be the glory forever and ever Amen. So out of those verses, let me connect the big picture of the kingdom to the local New Testament church. Here's truth number one. When God births a church, it's always about something bigger. When God births a church, it's always about something bigger. What we're reading here in the book of Philippians, we call it the book of Philippians, it's actually a letter that Paul wrote to the church at Philippi that he'd planted 10 years earlier. 10 years earlier, Paul, in response to the Macedonian call, you can read about it in Acts 16, finds himself following the Holy Spirit of God for the first time to the continent of Europe. The gospel comes from the Middle East and North Africa in response to this call. The gospel for the first time in Acts 16 makes its way to the continent of Europe. Paul, in preaching the gospel there in Europe, finds himself in the city of Philippi. And God uses Paul to birth the church. Now notice what he writes to them here in verse 15. He says, Philippians, you know in the beginning of the gospel. Now, when I read that phrase, the beginning of the gospel, did anybody in the room get emotional? Did anybody need to grab tissues and start wiping your eyes because you got emotional reading that phrase? No, you didn't, did you? You know why? Because you weren't there. See, that phrase doesn't mean to you what it meant to the church at Philippi. Paul is reminding them of when the church began. Now to you and me, there's no emotional connection, but it'd be like me standing up in Las Vegas and saying to our church, Hey, anybody here when we met in my house with 18 people and, and the people that are there immediately, they go back, their mind travels back to those moments in the early days of our church and some of the victories that God gave us. That's what Paul's doing. He's reminding them of when the church began. When he wrote that phrase, some, somebody said, hey, I know what he's talking about. Remember when he went down to the riverbank and he met Lydia and he shared the gospel with Lydia? Lydia was a prominent, wealthy businesswoman in Philippi and she heard the gospel there at the riverbank with Paul. She embraced Christ and she begged Paul to come back to her home and there in her home, Paul led her whole household to Christ and he began to disciple Lydia's family in the home and they said, oh, you remember what he did? He'd take us out into the streets and teach us how to engage the city with the gospel and share Jesus and Somebody said, oh, I remember one day we were out there sharing Jesus. And remember that demon-possessed slave girl that came up and started making fun of us? And you can read all this. It's in Acts 16. And they cast the demon out of her, and she gave her life to Christ. But you remember, everybody wasn't happy about that. The, they came and arrested Paul and Silas. They, they threw him in prison. And oh, you remember what happened next? In prison, the jail began to shake. The doors swing open, and the jailer comes in to kill himself. And 
They lead the jailer and his family to Christ. Boom, brand new church in Philippi. Upper crust, wealthy businesswoman, slave class, demon-possessed girl, middle class, blue collar, jailer and his family, brand new church in Philippi. You know what I love about that? A lot of times in North America, what we call church planting is not starting churches, it's starting church services, and that's not the same thing. You see, starting a church service attracts people who look like, walk like, talk like, think like, worship like you. When you start a church, you start with a city, you engage the city with the gospel, you make disciples, and then a church is born, and when that happens, the church looks like the community. Here's what that means. If our churches don't look like our communities, there's a missiological problem with how we're engaging our communities with the gospel. Paul writes to this church, and here's what he tells them. Remember when the church was born? Meeting in Lydia's home, ministries established, weekend gatherings, serving one another. Paul's reminding them when the church started, that wasn't the finish line. That was the starting line. A lot of times we get to this moment, buildings, budget, staff, programs, Look around, not an empty seat is full in here. And here's the attitude we have. Whew, mission accomplished. We made it, we did it. No, here's the deal. When God births a church, he has the nations on his heart. It's never just about what's happening here. And get this, we are living today in the greatest days in the history of Christianity to be alive. There are more people coming to faith in Jesus today on a daily basis around the world than at any other single time in human history history. You didn't hear what I just said. I told you we got 54 languages in our church. One of the beautiful parts of that is different cultures worship differently. Some of them worship louder than others. And I'm used to some people at times talking back to me a little bit. So I'm going to get you to help me right now. I'm going to say that again. I'm going to give you another shot. And if you hear what I say, I want you to say something. Here's what I said. We are living in the greatest days in the history of Christianity to be alive. There are more people currently coming to faith in Jesus around the world on a daily basis than at any other single time in human history. And get this. God birthed your church for such a time as this so that you can lift up your eyes and you can look on the fields and see that they are ripe for harvest. God did not birth your church just so you could be the best church in Jonesboro. God didn't birth your church just so you could have dynamic worship services. God didn't birth your church just so you could have this team up here leading and we could get a little taste of what heaven's going to be like. No, God birthed your church because he's on a mission. Did you know that there have been more people come to Christ in Iran in the last 100 years than in the previous 19 centuries combined? And here's what I want you to understand. That's not them. That's us. You know why? We're not just members of a church. We're citizens of a kingdom. And the kingdom is alive and well. And God birthed your church to get in on what he's doing Everything he's given you, he's given you to be leveraged for the sake of the expansion of the kingdom of God. Let me go to the second thing. Not only when God births a church is it always about something bigger, but when God births a church, he invites us to join in his activity. Look back at verse number 15. At the end of that verse, Paul says, when I left Macedonia, that's a region that Philippi was in, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. If you know any Greek, if you don't know this, the New Testament was written in Greek. If you know any Greek word at all, you know the Greek word for this phrase, entered into partnership. It's the Greek word koinonia. Heard that word before? Just about every good Baptist church got a Sunday school class called the koinonia class, right? Here's the problem. We think koinonia in Greek means in English, coffee pots, casseroles, and donuts. But that's not what it means. The word koinonia means to share in the life of another. It's fellowship. Fellowship's not just food and fun. Fellowship is is doing life together. It's sharing in each other's lives. And here's what Paul said. 
Paul said that this church understood God had raised them up for the expansion of his kingdom and they saw in Paul a relationship where they could join in Paul's life and by joining in Paul's life, they were joining in the mission of God. See, you're here in Jonesboro. You can live out the mission of God right here in Jonesboro. But you also have among you this week missionaries from all over the world. I believe the scripture teaches that the the kingdom of God runs on the rails of relationships. You live out the mission here in Jonesboro, but you join in the mission of God by sharing in the lives of these missionaries through giving and praying and sending. And as you share in their lives, you're joining in the mission of God. It's not just doing a program. This is what the early church did. When we talk about these things, this is not a strategy we came up with. This is the early church modeling for us what it looks like to engage in the mission. Well, how do we do it? What are some practical things we do? Let me give you three right out of this text. There are more, but these three are right here in this text. Number one, every church should cultivate a heart for the kingdom by praying. We can begin to pray for God's activity locally and globally. The church at Philippi was a praying church. Some of the greatest verses in all the Bible on prayer are in this text of Scripture. You ever heard this verse before? Be anxious for nothing, but in everything through prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, which passes all comprehension, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. You know where those verses are? Right here in this same chapter. Paul wrote them to the church at Philippi. The church at Philippi prayed for Paul. Paul prayed for this church. They joined in the activity of God through praying. Oh, okay, here we are. It's mission conference time. I know what you're telling us. Pray for the missionary. Does prayer really make a difference? (laughs) Well, here's what I'm not telling you. I'm not telling you I believe there's power in prayer. I am telling you I believe there's power in the one to whom we pray. Ain't no power in my praying. That's putting faith in faith. But there's power in the one that I'm talking to. When I got to Las Vegas, my first week on the field, I got a telephone call from a lady named Letty Peralta. She's from the Philippines. This beautiful young lady here a moment ago sang in Tagalog from the Philippines. Letty called me on the phone, and I I didn't know anybody in Las Vegas. She said, Pastor, can I tell you a story? I said, Letty, I don't know anybody in Las Vegas. You can tell me any story you want to tell me. Now, I've since learned in Las Vegas, be careful with that offer because there's some stories you probably shouldn't hear. But here's what she told me. She said, Pastor, I'm from the Philippines. I moved to Hong Kong to make money for my family that was very poor. While living in Hong Kong, I met an American family that worked for a major computer corporation in America. I moved in with them, became the caretaker of their family. She said, over a period of months and years, that family became my extended family, so much so that when they moved back to America, I got all the paperwork and I moved with them back to America. She said, we settled in a suburb north of Atlanta, Georgia called Woodstock, Georgia. She said, I visited a church called the First Baptist Church of Woodstock, Georgia. I heard the gospel and the kingdom of God preached like I'd never heard it before, and it radically changed my life. But she said, I only got to go there about six or seven times, and my family got relocated again to Las Vegas, Nevada. And she said, Pastor, honest before the Lord. She said, Pastor, I've been in Las Vegas for a year and a half, and I've prayed every day that the First Baptist Church of Woodstock, Georgia would start a church in Las Vegas, Nevada. Would you please tell me who sent you here? I stood there on the other end of the line with my jaw hanging wide open because two weeks earlier, my family loaded everything we owned in a green Dodge minivan in the parking lot of the First Baptist Church of Woodstock, Georgia, being sent out of that fellowship 2,000 miles across the country to Las Vegas, Nevada. None of us even knew Lady Peralta existed on the planet. We understood right then we didn't go to start something in Las Vegas. We went to get in on something that God was doing long before we got there. 22 years in, I told you a moment ago, 5,000 new believers almost have come to faith in Christ. It's awesome. When you got a church full of new first-generation Christians, they ain't no cultural Christianity, meaning this. The only reason somebody sits on the back row is they got their last. You see, we come in the Bible Belt. We come to church to go home. Like we do. We come planning to leave. When you got first-generation Christians, they come planning to meet with Jesus. <laughs> like you can do a three-hour service. They ain't going nowhere. They don't care. It's worship from the front row to the back row. It's unbelievable. 5,000 new believers working on four continents around the world, planting all these churches. I get a call a week, a call a month from some church planner says, man, how does a white dude from Alabama go to Las Vegas, plant a multi-ethnic church that's working all over the world? I'm not trying to be spiritual. I'm not trying to be humble. I'm just trying to be honest. 
There was one lady from the Philippines that asked God to do it for a year and a half, and we've been riding a wave of his favor for 22 years because she didn't quit. Listen. <laughs> 2015, she got married, moved to Florida. I almost moved with her. I thought, man, the glory of God has departed. I'm going with her. Wherever she goes, that's where I'm going. You know the problem with us in American church? We don't need God. We can do church for weeks and 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 weeks whether God ever shows up or not. I mean, we got planning center. We got buildings. We got programs. Why we need God? The early church wasn't like that. You know what they did? They prayed. You know what we've done in the American church? We've relegated corporate prayer to moments of transition when you move the band on and off the stage. We don't pray to pray anymore. We just pray to change the set. When nobody's looking. Well, we need to move some stuff. What do we do? Well, why don't we get somebody to pray right there? We'll get everybody to close their eyes and we'll move stuff around. Listen, I'm not saying it's wrong to move stuff while we pray. It's just wrong to pray only to move stuff. What happened to us coming together as a people of God and saying, we're desperate. If God's not God, we're sunk. We need the Lord. We need God to move locally. We need God to move globally. And we're so desperate that we're going to grab a hold of the altar of God and we're not going to let go until God does what he said he was going to do. Is there somebody here that God wants to raise up to be the next Lady Peralta to grab a hold of the altar of God? We started doing this at our church in Vegas. We lead our church every weekend in what we call spirit-led, scripture-fed, worship-based prayer. We take a verse of scripture, we take eight to ten minutes, and we lead the whole church to pray corporately, many times out loud, 4,000 people a weekend. Eight to ten minutes, all we do is pray. We've seen God do supernatural stuff. We've seen women healed of stage four cancer. We've seen people that were lost visit and come to know Christ. We've seen unbelievable stuff happen. People say, man, you can't, you can't do that in a big church. You can't pray for ten minutes. What about lost people who come? Are they not uncomfortable? Let me tell you what I found out. When lost people come to a church, they actually expect us to talk to God. <laughs> Not only that, they actually came to church hoping we might show them how they could talk to God. What did Jesus say about his church? My house shall be called a what? House of what? Preaching? No. Mission? No. Disciple making? No. My house shall be called a house of what? Prayer. Notice what he said. My house shall be what? Called. Here's what that means. People in Jonesboro? Here's what they ought to say about you. I don't know everything about them. I don't know everything they believe. I don't know all they do, but I know this. You need to talk to God. That's where you go. That's a prayerless bunch of people I know. What if you took time and you just carved out moments to pray for the nations, to pray for the activity of God in Jonesboro, to pray for North America? Secondly, every church should prioritize the kingdom by sending, by sending Look what he said in verse 18. Verse 18, he said, I've received everything from Epaphroditus. Who in the world is Epaphroditus? Like, well, what is that? We think it's something you take penicillin to get rid of, right? I used to have a bad case of Epaphroditus, but I'm much better now. I got the vaccine. I'm good. <laughs> Too soon? I'm sorry. <laughs> no, Epaphroditus was a real dude in the Bible. Like, you're going to meet him in heaven, and he's going to say, do you like my story? And you're going to say, oh, it's great. I have no idea who he is, so I'm going to help you. I'm going to save you that embarrassment right now. Epaphroditus was a regular dude in Philippi. Somebody led to Jesus, brought him to Lydia's house. They discipled him at Lydia's house. One day they took up an offering, said, we want to send an offering to the apostle Paul to join in what God's doing. They didn't have PayPal, Venn, Moselle. They had to have somebody carry a bag of money and go give it to Paul. They said in church one day, anybody willing to go? Epaphroditus said, like, I'm no preacher. I've never been to seminary, but I can carry a bag of money with the best of them. I'll go. You say, how do you know that? Look at chapter 2, verse 25. Chapter 2, verse 25, Paul's writing this letter back to Philippi. He says, I thought it necessary to send to you, Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker, and fellow soldier, who is your messenger and minister to my need. You know who Epaphroditus is? He's the first recorded short-term mission trip in the history of the Bible. They send him out from Philippi. He goes for a few days, weeks, months, works with Paul. Then he comes back to the church at Philippi to tell them how things are going. How do you know he came back? Where do you think we got the letter from? Paul wrote this letter, gave it to Epaphroditus, sent him home to thank the church for their investment in what he was doing. 
You know what the church at Philippi valued? Sending people out. What if in the church in America, our measure of success was not how many people we seat, but how many people we send? You let a group of pastors get together, give them five minutes, I promise you they're going to talk about how many people they had Sunday at their church. What if we stop talking about how many we had and we start talking about how many we unleashed, how many we sent? That's the spirit of the early church. Finally, every church should invest in the kingdom by giving. I won't spend much time here, but that's really what this letter's about. This letter's about an offering that they gave. You've been asked by your pastor, by your team here, to prayerfully consider a weekly, a monthly, a quarterly, a one-time gift that you can give for the nation's. You can give for the expansion of God's kingdom locally and globally. You can make an investment in what God is doing. That's modeled here. That's not a program your pastor came up with. The early church did the same thing. And Paul says, man, they gave consistently. He said, you gave once and again. He said, you gave sufficiently. You met my needs. Paul said, you gave abundantly. He said, I'm well supplied. It means over abundantly supplied. They gave sacrificially. They gave more than they could afford to give. So when we pray and we send and we give, then you get to verse 19. My God will supply. Here's what Paul said. You seek first the kingdom. (laughs) Hang on, because you can't outgive God. He'll take care of everything else. That shouldn't surprise us. As a matter of fact, Jesus said the exact same thing in Matthew chapter 6. Remember what he said? Seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you. You know what Jesus said? You seek first the kingdom, I'll take care of the rest. Our church in Las Vegas, we've seen God live that out now for 22 years. When we were just a brand new church, we started in September 2001, our first public worship service. December 2001, we sent our first team overseas to Africa. About eight eight guys, we got in a plane, went to Africa on a mission trip. In October of that year, the missionary we were going to work with, he was a national from South Africa, was in Las Vegas, and so I asked him to preach in our church. Now, our church was only five weeks old, and I told him before he preached, I said, Harold, I love you. I'd love to pay you. We're a brand new church plant. We're five weeks old. We live out of that offering basket. So you preach the stars down, but I'm not giving you anything today. You just preach. We're going to come bring a team. We're going to work with you. Harold got up, started preaching. I fell under deep conviction. I got up after that service, and I said to our church, I said, church, we got one more service to go, and I told Harold before the service, we weren't going to give him anything, but I was sitting there listening to him preach, and God convicted me that we need to give him everything. I said, everything that comes in the offering basket today, we're giving 100% of it to him, even though we needed every dime of it. We're giving 100% of it away. They gave $7,000 that Sunday. It was the largest offering we'd had in the five weeks of our church, and something in my soul literally died. I handed Harold that check. I took Harold to lunch. I tried to be happy. I wasn't. (laughs) Sitting at lunch with Harold, a couple walks over to my table. Said, Pastor, we uh, were visiting your church this morning from out of state. Our church back home told us about your church plant. We wanted to come see it. And they actually sent a gift that we're supposed to give to you in this envelope. And we got so caught up in the service this morning, we forgot to give it to you. They laid it down on the table. I opened that envelope. There was a check inside it for $15,000. The next weekend, I stood before our church and I said, if we'll seek first the kingdom, he'll take care of everything else. I'm not saying you give to get. I'm saying when you put first the kingdom... Put your seatbelt on. He will take care of you. Whether it's resources, people, teams, whatever you got. Here's the last truth and I'm done. When God births a church, it's for his glory. Paul said a lot of things about the church at Philippi in this text, but notice how he closed it. Now to our God and Father be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Here's what he said to Philippi. Philippi, you're a wonderful church, but it ain't about you. It's about the glory and honor of God among cities and nations all over the world. Central Baptist Jonesboro, you're a great church. It's been a joy to watch from a distance over the last 19 years how God has just blessed and raised up this fellowship. You're a great church, but listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. 
It's not about you. If nobody ever knows the name Central Baptist Church, Jonesboro, Arkansas, it don't matter. Here's what matters. The glory of God. The glory of God among every tribe, every tongue, every people, every nation. And my challenge to you today is leverage and lean in everything you have for that. Because one day, this is going to be gone. But let me tell you what. The kingdom is going to be all right. When you live for the kingdom, you're living for that which is eternal. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, would you, as only you can, take these truths by the power of your Holy Spirit, bring conviction, bring change, bring transformation. As you sit quietly with your heads bowed, we're going to have a time of response to close this service. Your worship pastor is going to lead us in a song of surrender. And it's a time for everybody in the room to respond. You say, what's my response? It depends on where you are. Maybe you're here today and you're not a Christian. You listen to this crazy guy from Alabama by way of Las Vegas up here shouting and hollering and passionately speaking. And you're like, what is this all about? Let me tell you what it's all about. Let me tell you why I'm trying to motivate this church today. Because there are people just like you all over the world who've never met Jesus. By the billions. People that have never heard his name. And oh, his name is so sweet. If you're here today and you don't know him, listen. Here's the story of the Bible in a few sentences. The story of the Bible is that God made you to love you, to know you, and to be known and loved by you. That's why you were made. But we've all sinned against God, and our sin against God has separated us from that relationship. But here's the story of the gospel. God loved you so much, he didn't leave you there. He sent his son Jesus into the world. Jesus did what you and I couldn't do. He lived a sinless life, and then he offered his body as a substitute for you and me. He died on the cross and took all of your sin and all of my sin on himself. And on the cross, he paid the penalty for our sin. But, oh, the great news is he didn't stay dead. God raised him from the dead as a testimony that he had accepted his sacrifice for our sin so that now you and I can simply turn from our sin, put our faith in Jesus, and we get forgiveness, and by grace, we become sons and daughters of God. You are restored to a right relationship with God. If you're here today and you do not have a relationship with God, when we stand to sing in just a moment, you can come to one of these pastors at the front and just say, I need Jesus. And they'll, from the Bible, show you how you can begin a relationship with God. It'll change your life. I'm telling you, it happened to me when I was a freshman in college. September 1989, I met Jesus. He changed my life. For the rest of you that already know Jesus, here's your response today. Your pastor, your team, they've prepared a card that you received when you came in. You've been praying over it for a couple of weeks about your involvement personally, your praying, your giving, your going, your sending. You know what today needs to be for many of you in the building? It needs to be, and those watching online, it needs to be the day that you put your yes on the table, just like I did 22 years ago. You say, what's the question? I don't know, but Lord and anything but yes don't go together. It's just, Lord, yes. Let him ask the question when he's ready. You just put the yes on the table. For some of you, you can do that. Your pastor said it earlier. You can bring that card during this offering, and you can lay it up here on this altar as a, as a symbol of your yes on the table, or you can drop it in a basket on your way out, however you feel led. Maybe God's calling you like someone in the last service to surrender your life to mission or ministry. You come to one of these pastors and just say, I surrender today, yes, to Jesus. Listen, I did it 22 years ago. I know there can be fear. I know there can be trepidation. But let me tell you this. As a guy who's 22 years on the other side of it, it's the greatest ride of your life. God, move today. Draw people to yourself by your spirit. Lord, have your way. In Jesus' name we pray. Let's stand together. He's going to lead us. The pastors are here.